All right. What's up, guys? We've got another episode of the Growth by Sean podcast. So I'm here with Matt McLeod today. Matt, how are you? I'm wonderful. And thank you for also saying my last name correctly. I appreciate All right. That. Usually, <laughs> usually I uh, actually preempt and ask people how to pronounce it first, but um, I just didn't and I just went with it. So that works. You nailed it. But sweet. So how I like to start the podcast is just a little bit about you and your story and your identity, I could say. Um, and you can start wherever and go as long as you'd like, and we'll go from there. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first, first, thanks for having me on, dude. Um, of course. I really appreciate it. So let me do the quick, quick background here. Um, so I'm originally from Kentucky, and uh, now I am based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, but I was born and raised in Kentucky, and then kind of it's probably most helpful if I kind of get into how I got into the fitness space and stuff and uh, so that happened uh, essentially out of high school I wanted to get bigger stronger and faster for football uh, starting my sophomore year I, I started varsity as a cornerback at around like 160 pounds or something like that around the same height that I am right now like 510 511 and I knew that if I wanted to play with the bigger guys the bigger, stronger, and faster I got, the better I was going to have uh, my better chances on the field would be. And so I knew that getting into the weight room was going to be my best bet at doing that. And so I uh, I knew that the, the, the smarter that I got with diet and exercise, the quicker my results would come. And so that's kind of what led to me doing my own research in a, a lot of these things. And uh, from there, I started to actually see results and i think that was one of the first times it really clicked for me in my head that the the direct results of your efforts plus um like strategic methods could result in actually reaching your goals and actualizing those goals and so this was something that was complete this wasn't like school or something you know with school you're you're, you're like okay this is the path you take you're going to go to high school, then you're going to go to college, and then you're going to get this degree, and then you're going to get this job, it's right? It's like there's there's somewhat of a path. And so this was one of the first kind of autonomous things that I did on my own, where I learned uh, a lot about this stuff and uh, a lot of after learning and then also applying those things to my life, I actualized a lot of these goals and things started to happen in my life, right? So I started to become better at football. I did get bigger, stronger, and faster. By the time that I was a senior, I was a cornerback and also a fullback. I gained about 30 pounds of muscle. And so I went from like 160 to 190 by my senior year. Uh, and I became known as like the fitness guy. People started to uh, look at me differently. They started to treat me differently. You know, girls started to say stuff about my muscles, which was amazing. Uh, guys said stuff about my muscles too, which is also cool. Um, but like that was, yeah, that was one of the first times where I, I was like, okay, I can put my mind to something and I can actually achieve it uh, and it can make my life better. And I know that sounds kind of simplistic, but that was a big kind of eureka moment for me. And so then that allowed me to, uh, it kind of gave me permission that I could take life and my goals into my own hands. Uh, and so from there, I got into college and my plans were to be a physical therapist, but I sucked at chemistry. And so I knew that my paths were either going to be uh, like a trainer or a coach, or I was going to be a dietitian. And so it was between the paths of exercise science or nutrition. And I knew that if I wanted to be a coach, I didn't necessarily need an exercise science degree. And I could just, you know, to be a personal trainer, you can just get a certification or something like that. But to be a dietitian, you uh, you have to go to school, right? You have to go through a big, long process. And also, I knew that if I wanted to run my own business and become my uh, become a coach, I, I knew that becoming a registered dietitian would give me an upper hand on a lot of uh, my competition out there, right? And I also knew that it was a fallback in case everything screwed up and I failed as a coach. And, and so uh, I went the registered dietitian route. And uh, long story short, by the time that I graduated. And by the time that I passed my RD exam, I already had uh, enough clients to kind of fully uh, support myself and, and kind of do this on my own. And so I started my business in 2015, whenever I was like a junior in college. And then by the time, yeah, that I graduated, became an RD, I was able to do it 
full time. And so that was in 2018. And essentially ever since then, I have been coaching uh, clients one on one full time. Hmm. And so, yeah, that is that's the, the quick rundown of where I am today. I see. So what's interesting to me from my perspective, or I'll even say like a customer's perspective, what your business is about is sustainable results. And in your story, you had started when you first started with football, it was about getting the quick results for you. So when did that transition start to happen from, I want quick results to I can help others get results, but in a sustainable lengthy amount of time. So it was more so it's, it was more so like I, it, you can make a certain amount of decisions. So if you make, let's say a hundred decisions, right? Those decisions that you make can be better or worse based on the amount of specific knowledge that you have, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you can make some decisions that are going to lead to greater outputs than other decisions, right? And so I knew that the smarter that I got, the better my decision-making process could become. And so it wasn't necessarily about getting results more quickly. It was more so just about, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess it was, right? But also even with the clients that I work with today, it is still about sustainability, but it's, it's more so the decisions that these people are making are going to have a lot more factors involved. So like kids, careers, um, uh, you know, hobbies, different things, uh, wives, husbands, they're going to have so many other variables than I did whenever I was in high school, right. Or whenever mm -hmm. I was in college. And so essentially the, the evolution of my coaching has gone from what started as more so along the lines of bodybuilding and kind of like the extreme. Cause that's, I competed in bodybuilding. I competed in two mm -hmm. bodybuilding competitions. I won my drug tested pro card back in 2016 actually. And, um, that's like a very, that's the very extreme end of the spectrum of discipline and sacrifice and all these things. But I was in college and sure I, you know, I was busy in things, but you're never as busy as you think you are in college. Whenever you're looking at it hindsight several years later. Um, so I, cause I was in the gym, you know, five to six days a week, two hours at a time. It's like, I, I was, I, I lived with a bunch of meatheads. It's like, that was mostly all that I was doing. Um, but my career evolved and the type of clients that I work with and the problems that I solved evolved as I got older. And so mm -hmm. I went from bodybuilding and kind of that extreme end of the spectrum to working with more general population and more so uh, now it's actually cool because uh, as of probably the past like year and a half or so, I'm starting to work with a lot more, um, for lack of a better term, it's kind of like high performers. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like entrepreneurs, uh, CEOs, supervisors, directors, project managers, supervisors, that kind of stuff, uh, those types of people. And um, what I've realized is that I can take the knowledge that I learned from the bodybuilding days to the extreme end of the spectrum. Right. So those decisions, those those um, quote unquote optimal decisions that are evidence based and, and essentially like what's the best. What are the best levers we can pull to create the best outcomes possible? And I've taken that and now applied it to the general population that I work with, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, sure, they have different schedules than me and they have, um, uh, you know, even different desired results and things. And they have different um, uh, sacrifices and things that they have to, to give. And so it's my job to make sure that the decisions that they can make and the trade-offs that they're willing to sacrifice align with the results that they want. So in short, I have to match, I have to make sure that they match their actions to their ambitions, right? I just want to make sure that they're not bullshitting themselves and say, Hey, I want your bodybuilding results in 12 weeks. Whenever I also run a business, have kids, have a spouse, have hobbies, right? All these other things. And they're not willing to give up all these, these sacrifices and give up all, all, you know, all these things to get these results that they say that they want. And I'm like, okay, you can get these results, but here's what's going to have to happen. You know, you're not going to be able to drink. You're going to have to track every calorie. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do cardio, all these different things. And I'm like, okay, do you still want that goal? Right. Mm. And 
that's where I just have to actually be a coach and actually have to communicate with them. It's like, Hey, here is what seems more possible given your level of ambition with this stuff and also your availability and your schedule and your time and everything. It's like, you can still get the best results possible based off of what you're able or willing to do. And I think that managing those expectations is the number one thing that most people um, and most coaches and, and people trying to reach their fitness goals don't consider. And that actually needs to be the very first thing that they consider because that lays the foundation for where all of your decisions come from. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. you, you have to know what to expect um, and you have to accept certain trade-offs in order to make these decisions. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's one of the, the, the biggest things. And it's, this is also this last thing I'll say on this is like, it's mm -hmm. an ongoing process of managing expectations because you on your normal routine, right. And on a day-to-day -day basis, you go to work, you come home, you go to the gym, um, right. You come back, you eat dinner with the family, you do this, there's a set routine, but then whenever you go on vacation, right. It's like, you, you're not, maybe your expectations are going to change mm -hmm. or maybe a friend comes in town for a weekend and you want to go out to eat, you want to drink, you want to go to parties or whatever it is that you want to do, right? Um, you just don't want to be quote unquote on track as much as possible. And so that's going to go back to, okay, what trade-offs are you willing to accept in this moment? And there is no right or wrong answers. It's just like, you just need to make a conscious decision on what makes sense for you in this moment. And you have to do that over and over and over and over again. And it's just my job as a coach to kind of illuminate to them and help them get out of their own way and illuminate what really matters to them. Mm. Right. I think, so, I think yeah. that's very interesting. Let me, instead of unpacking all of it, let me ask you this from your perspective. So sure. when we look at like someone that wants perhaps like your body, correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's like wanting the woman in the shiny dress. Why do you think so many people are drawn to that? and believe that that is going to fix all their problems. I think it's, I think it's human nature. I think it's, mm. uh, I think it is, it's the same thing with money. It's the same thing. It's like the, there's many sayings with, with abs, but it's like most of the time for me, it's, it's, it's not about like, I'm not, whenever I say helping them manage their expectations, I'm not going to be like, Hey, you know, you're never going to have abs, like stop mm -hmm. thinking that way. It's not, it's not my job to like shoot down their dreams or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's more so to just help them arrive at a more logical conclusion based off of the, the evidence of their life and of what's possible. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and allowing them to come to that conclusion themselves. And then that they, then they can accept that new reality and then they can move forward from that new starting point. And that makes it much, much more impactful. Um, and they can do this over and over again, but, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's with abs. Sometimes it's like, I have to help clients get abs just to realize that they, that's not what is make going to make them happy. Right. It's like, they, mm. it's kind of like the money thing. It's like, if you want to, if you think that money is going to make you a lot of, like, it's going to make you happy, like, sure. Make that your goal, get a lot of money and then see how you feel. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, my guess is that it's going to make things better. Don't get me wrong, but it's probably still not going to fulfill what you thought it was going to fulfill. And sometimes they need to touch the stove to actually understand that it's hot. Right. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I, I think some people can come to that conclusion where it's just like, Oh, okay. That's, that's not going to make me happy. Cause then maybe they've, you can point to other goals that they've achieved. Right. It's like, how many mm. things are you doing today that you only dreamed of three years ago or five years ago or, or, or whatever. And then, what are you still wanting and desiring? Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, in three year, three more years, maybe you'll get that. And then there's going to be another thing that you choose. And so whenever you just, whenever I can re relate to them, it's, it's, it's all about the, the cliche, like getting back to the process, mm -hmm. making them focus on the process and, and doing it for its own sake as, as, as instead of the outcome, um, which is very difficult. And I think you could still use both, but I think, getting them to consciously focus on the process and, and realize why they're doing these things and why it's important to them and 
why they it, it's not necessarily the abs that are going to make them happy, but it is all of the habits and routines and um, uh, things that they accomplish along the way and and how they feel reaching that goal in the first mm -hmm. place, that's what's going to end up making them happy, right? It's it's the person that they become on their way to the goal, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Like that's that's the main thing. And once they realize that the goalposts just never stop moving and life is just a series of games, no matter if it's in fitness or if it's in life in general um, or with money or career or whatever, it's just like, it's just a series of games and it's just going to be one game after the other game after the other game, right? And there is no mm. winning necessarily, or or it's always winning, right? It's it's kind mm. of it's kind of how you look at it. It's either never winning or you're always winning. And I choose to I choose to think that I'm always winning because I'm able to continue playing the game. And okay. the more games that I can choose to play by my own autonomy, I think that is what makes it worth doing. Mm. Yeah. So was there a time in your life where you had desired an outcome and it ended up being kind of the same scenario where you wanted this outcome so bad, but once you got there, you realized that this isn't actually what you wanted? Is there a personal story to that? You mean, you mean like every day? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, so for business, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like the six figures thing, you know, it's mm -hmm. like whenever I hit six figures, I'm like, okay, cool. This is dope. But mm -hmm. now it's like, okay, now I'm comparing myself to what I did last year, you mm -hmm. know, and now I have to do better. Now I have to make 20% more revenue than I did last year. And mm -hmm. I also have to work less and I also have to have better relationships and I also have to look better. And I also have to have, you know, all these different things. And so that's that's kind of what I have to keep going back towards is, is just realizing, oh, I'm doing the stupid human thing that we do, right? Over and over and mm -hmm. over again. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think it started with making my own business and then mm -hmm. getting enough clients to um, you know, not work as a registered dietitian at a hospital, mm -hmm. right? And then it became, uh, you know, my first 10K month or something like that. And then it mm -hmm. became making six figures, and now it's going to be making like mid six figures is the next goal, right? Something like that, mm -hmm. you know, um, or, or what I'm realizing now is that I have different seasons in life and business isn't a huge priority for me right now. It's still, it's mm -hmm. still a necessity, right? So it's still a priority and it's still something mm -hmm. that I love doing. Um, but I'm not in the hardcore grind mode that I was like whenever I was in college, whenever I was first starting out, whenever I was first trying to, um, you know, support myself doing this. Now, mm -hmm. this season of life for me, especially since I just moved to Austin recently, like in the past mm -hmm. six months, um, has been relationships and has been mm -hmm. community and connecting with people. And that's the area of life that gives me the most fulfillment right now. And so I'm essentially like, how little can I work to continue to keep my business running um, mm -hmm. while focusing on all these other things that I want to focus on, right? Mm -hmm. Like I also just bought a piano here recently. It's like, I want to learn how to play the piano. Um, I would love to learn a little bit more Spanish. Um, being down here in Texas, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, <laughs> well, to be completely transparent, there's a lot of Latina mm -hmm. women down here that mm -hmm. really um, are <laughs> cool. And so mm -hmm. it's like learning Spanish is, is, is something that I'm somewhat interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, and connecting with all my friends and spending time with them. And if that's like, Hey, let's ditch work at 12 PM and go to Barton Springs, which is like this natural spring here. And, um, you know, we can go and just chill and, and, and hang out outside and go for walks or, uh, you know, have a wine at, at noon or something. It's like, that's, mm -hmm. that sounds way better. Um, yeah. and, and where in the past I might not have been able to afford to do that. Right. And so for this season of life, that's, that's kind of what I'm focusing on. And I think the next time I get excited, which is probably going to be soon starting to get excited about a new project in business, then I'll, then I'll switch gears and I'll focus more on the, on the business side of things. Um, mm. so yeah, I'm trying to not pigeonhole myself too much. And that's why I like routines and things. Mm -hmm. Um, I try and keep them flexible because I, I'm much more like go by feel and I just want to 
uh, navigate it. Yeah, I want to navigate it how I want to navigate it, but it, it's taken a lot of work to be able to set my life up this way. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's also important to mention as well. So since you work online, how do you go about building relationships and connecting with others? Like what are some of the difficulties of it since you primarily work online? Yeah, that's true. I, I would say, I would say the, the difficulty is if, so let me just, let me back up. And so yeah, no, I've worries, always, no, worries. I, no, no, I've always had, so I've always had, I've always had close friends. So mm -hmm. growing up in Kentucky, I've had a core friend group that I've been friends with uh, since I was in like kindergarten, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, hometown friends that I grew up with. Um, and as I started my online business, I started to joke that I had went while I was still living in Kentucky. I was like, I have, I have my in real life friends and then I have my internet friends. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's all of the, the internet friends are all the other coaches and, and people that I've met online over the years that I had never met in person, but we talk very frequently online. Right. I've talked to them several times, right. I'd be there, you know, maybe I came on the podcast or, or whatever it is. And we've just stayed connected DMS and uh until finally so so a good example of this would be carter good so my mm -hmm. buddy carter who also lives here in austin um i back whenever he lived in columbus ohio and i lived in kentucky uh he one day reached out to me uh well so first sorry we were in a we were in a business mastermind in 2017 together it was jordan syatt's business mastermind actually mm -hmm. um we were in jordan syatt's business mastermind and that's where we met and then I think in 28, and so we, we met there, we hit it off, we talked probably for the next year or two. And then finally he actually reached out and was like, Hey, I live in Columbus, which was like a four hour drive for me or something. He was like, do you want to come hang out? Do you want to come stay with me at my apartment <laughs> um, and hang out in real life? And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, that sounds dope. That's, I would really love that. And so the first time I met him, I went, I stayed at his apartment in, in Austin, or I'm sorry, in Columbus. And we really hit it off. And that kind of was the beginning of the, 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 that relationship. And that bridged the gap between finally being internet friends to being in real life friends. And uh, we stayed really good friends and stayed connected. And then he moved to Austin. And then, so I came and visited him in Austin several times. And there was plenty of other people here as well, other coaches and people in the industry, um, that were around and I got to meet them in real life too, or at least I got to hang out with them much more in mm -hmm. real life. Um, and so it's like the internet is amazing because it is that it can serve as that bridge to meeting really incredible people that aren't um, just in your local area. And you can actually make, if you put forth the effort and you put forth the time and, and uh, you know, you can actually turn those into, in real life relationships. And so, um, of course, it, yeah, it's a double-edged sword because being online also means that you, I am in front of a laptop the majority of the day, but I've solved that problem by moving to Austin. Now I have, I can stay in front of my laptop, but also I'm on the fourth floor and Carter's on the first floor. <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. like in the same apartment building that I live in. Right. And so we, we literally live in the same place. And also now there's a bunch of other coaches that if I want to go to a local coffee shop, I can go hang out with them. Um, and so it, it's like, yeah, I, I think that it can, it can be frustrating if you live in an area where there's not as many people, but it's kind of, it's, it's kind of up to you. You can still, you can still do FaceTimes with people or you can do Zooms with people. Um, that's what happened to me with several of these other coaches. We FaceTime several times and then finally we got to meet in person. Um, but it, yeah, if you work online, then you do have the option potentially to end mm. up moving to hang out with those people. And I think that that is for me personally, it has been super worthwhile. Uh, it was hard to leave my hometown friends, um, but I'm still friends with them. I go home like every three months or so because I still very much cherish seeing my family and, and friends there. And so it's like, if you want to make it work, you can. And so I think it's up to you. And I think that you can use the internet and bend it to uh, whatever amount of effort your and yeah, whatever amount of effort you're willing to put in. Mm, no, I understand that. So how important have masterminds been to you? I think they've been really good. So I also think that you okay. can buy friendships. 
Okay. I also think that I also think that you can not buy friendships, but you can buy the opportunity to create a friendship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've done with several of my mentors. And so prime example is John Romanello. So John mm -hmm. Romanello, um, uh, for people who don't know, he was, uh, he, he was much bigger in the fitness space back like 2010 to like 2015 ish. Um, he, uh, yeah, he, he did a lot of great work in the fitness space and then he started to do business mentoring and, uh, I signed up for business mentoring with him, I think in like 2018, 2019, something like that. And so then I met him for the first time in New York, I went and I stayed with him legit in his apartment, um, after, cause we had worked together for several months and been talking mm -hmm. on the phone and things. And, um, so yeah, I went to New York, I got to meet him for the first time. We got to hang out. We really hit it off. Uh, and then over time we became friends and we, we started to talk more and more. And so we stayed connected and I, uh, worked with him for about a year, like actually on my business. But then also during that time, you're going to develop a friendship with them as well. Um, and last week I just got back from his wedding in Cabo, Mexico. Mm. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like what started as a business mentorship turned into me being invited to his very intimate, like 40 person wedding, right. With some of his closest friends. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's why it's very important to be able to take advantage of opportunities that present themselves like that. And so I think, cause during that time, whenever I got into his mentorship, he was accepting like five people or something like that into his mm -hmm. mentorship. And this is the first time he'd opened it up in a while and you had to apply and you had to get accepted and all these different things. And I got accepted and I, it was a lot of money for me at the time. It was like, you know, it was like 1100 bucks a month. And mm -hmm. I was still starting out with my coaching business, but I was like, screw it. I'll, I'll do it. It was the same thing with Jordan Syatt's back in 2017. I think I was mm -hmm. making like two grand a month but I spent $700 per month on his mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's because I had saved money and I was able to put myself in a position to capitalize on that opportunity whenever it presented itself. And then I took advantage of that opportunity and then also went the extra mile to actually become friends with them and to really put forth effort. Like you have mm -hmm. to put forth effort and you have to put forth time um, and you have to keep showing up and, and so I think that's, and then through that mastermind, I met several other friends, right? And so that's, the, that's where those webs of things, if you use masterminds like they're intended, and if the mastermind is set up in a way that is how masterminds should be, some of them are complete nonsense now. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like, if you use them for what they are, you can meet some really dope people. So uh, Sam Forget, he was mm -hmm. in Romans, uh, he was in John Romanello's mastermind, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. at some point. Um, and so it's like, yeah, it's, you, you just, you just have to be ready to capitalize on those opportunities. And then you also have to really, um, be intentional. You have to be mm -hmm. intentional about what you do and, and who you are as a person. And, um, yeah. And so not only do you have to be ready from like a financial standpoint and career standpoint or something like that, but also from like, uh, this is the reason why you do personal development shit, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you want to become the type of person that those people will hang out with. Do you know mm. what I'm saying? It's like, they're yeah. not just going to hang out with anybody. And that's not, that's not a thing where it's like, Oh, they're, they're morally superior or mm -hmm. any way, anything like that. It's just like they have standards and they are a high quote unquote caliber type of person for a reason. And they, they do these certain things for a reason. And, and you have to, you, you, that's why you work on yourself. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think that's, um, so yeah, masterminds can be very important in, in those ways. <laughs> yeah. In those ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why do you think it's so difficult for people to take that next step of like actually being intentional with what they do as opposed to kind of this numbness that some people go through of just the same routine every day, not really being present with what they do? Um does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think um if not, I can reword it in a better. No, it's okay. So it's like, uh, why don't people capitalize what? on those opportunities, essentially? Yeah, yeah. I think um, maybe they're, sometimes maybe they aren't ready or, or sometimes mm -hmm. they, uh, maybe 
it's what's well, comfort, right? It's scary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's uncomfortable to put yourself out there or to travel to New York City for a mastermind or something, or mm -hmm. to take the leap to even spend the money in the first place because you might not think it's worth it. But mm -hmm. it's like, I think anytime. So, so for example, so my little sister, uh, who's 23, she's trying to get into the fashion space and be like a stylist for celebrities and things, mm -hmm. which is obviously, you know, a very difficult field to get into. Mm -hmm. Um, however, she follows this girl on TikTok, and the girl on TikTok is a celebrity stylist and she's kind of like an up and coming one. She definitely has like a resume with a couple of stylists or with a couple, uh, big like NBA players and, and things like that. So she, she's worked with credible people, but she's not like the tip top um, of stylists to where mm -hmm. they're not even accessible. Right. And so on her TikTok, she also, her side job, uh, or the other thing that she does is like coaching calls for mm -hmm. other people who are up and coming. They want to be stylists. They want to try and have her job. And so mm -hmm. she has coaching calls for like $500 per call for like a 60 minute call. Mm -hmm. And my little sister sent it to me and she was like, she was like, do you think this would be worth it? She was like this. I think this girl's credible. I trust her. I've been following for her for a long time. She was like, just check out her TikTok and just give me your first like judgment on her. Um, and to me, I looked at it and I was like, okay, for the minimal, um, I, I was looking at her more as like a person as opposed to what I know about styling. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, yeah, I mean, she checks out to me. And I was like, the way that I think about it is like, it's $500. And I was like, you're, you can easily make 500. You're going to like, the, here's here's how you look at it there's there's two different options it's like you you do it and then it's not worth the 500 dollars, and so you lose 500 dollars, right mm -hmm. so that's that's the downside however the upside is you spend the 500 dollars, and she connects you to somebody that could eventually change your career path and change your life forever right mm -hmm. or, or you make a connection with her because maybe she really likes how you are on the call and she continues to help you maybe she wants to like friend you or something like that something something sparked on that call that she wanted to help you more and that mm -hmm. maybe that led to another call and maybe that led to a, a, even one decision that got her on a quicker trajectory to the career path that she wanted than if she would have done it on her own and i was like that's a huge asymmetric risk, right? The, the downside is very, very little, but the potential upside is huge. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, that's what I think too many people think about with the, with the, the, the money side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people get scared on that. And I'm just like, dude, you're gonna, especially whenever you're in that beginning stages of trying to make shit happen like she is. Mm -hmm. uh, and cause it's like, there's no, there's no school path to be like, hey, here's how you be a celebrity stylist. This mm -hmm. is the shit it's, it's based on connections. It's based off of things like finding a, you know, C list celebrity stylist. And she happens to do coaching calls and she's in the type of, she's in, she's not, she's not in the, the end of the journey, like somebody who's styling LeBron James, but she's more accessible. And so that's the person that you talk to. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's who you get help from. And because then it's more so maybe a matter of time before she becomes that person for LeBron James. And my sister got in with her while she was still, uh, you know, styling lower level, quote unquote, celebrities. And so it's like, those are the opportunities that you have to seize that you can't be afraid of fucking up or you can't be afraid of losing money or mm -hmm. spending money on a course or, or whatever it is. Like, if you think it's going to help you, it's like you have to, even with, with fitness coaching, it's like, okay, the potential downside of course your, your health can, your health can be risky. And so that's, that's going to be a little bit different because mm -hmm. some coaches can really screw you up, but for the most part, right. Let's just say, let's say there's a difference between a good coach and then like a great coach. And so maybe you, you spend $400 a month with a coach and they don't keep, you don't, you don't lose the 20 pounds that you wanted to lose. Right. It's like, okay, sure. That's, that's kind of shitty, but the potential upside that you could get from working with a great coach is like, you can learn how to manage your nutrition for the rest of your life. And you can learn how to, you can get the body that you want and you can learn how to maintain that. You can lose a bunch of weight and prevent yourself from getting disease and you can expand, expend, I'm sorry, you're, you can, you can live fucking longer. Do you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Yeah. It's like, that's a pretty good trade-off to me, you know, like, okay, I'm going to spend $1,200 over the next three months and I'm going to change my fitness forever. And I'm going to add years to my life. It's like, I just, I think that people, yeah, they, they just don't think about these things. Um, 
in like probabilities and like logistically. And, and mm -hmm. I think that that's a, I think it's a big mistake. So yeah, like don't, don't be scared, especially when it comes to money. Of course, don't be fucking stupid. But like for the most mm -hmm. part, if you have the money and it's more so just kind of like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work or not, you should do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should just do it. Yeah. So did you always have that mindset around money or when you were more first starting out, were you a little bit more hesitant of these things? Was this something that was learned or kind of just in your DNA a little bit more? It was, it was the, it, it's definitely been in my DNA to, it's been, definitely been in my DNA to like go after it and, and mm -hmm. really be self-sufficient. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I knew that I knew that I knew that books, here's the thing is like what I, this is, is full circle. Cause what I said in the beginning is all the stuff that I learned that wasn't from a coach in the beginning, that was from reading blogs and magazines and articles and books on my own. Right. And so I knew I was like, okay, all of these things I learned on my own and they were just kind of more so broad topic. I was just kind of, you know um, you know, I was just spraying with my knowledge and be like learning everything that I could. Mm -hmm. Whereas a coach can be a very specific form of problem solving, right? And so it's like something like a coach can can get you there much faster than a book or a program or, or something, right? If As long as you have a good coach. And so I think as soon as I took that leap, because I had two online coaches for my bodybuilding competitions and they helped me mm -hmm. significantly more than if I would do it by myself. <laughs> and if I didn't believe in the fitness coaching, uh, or I'm sorry, I just applied that same mentality to business, right? If mm. I, if I, if business coaches can help you in the same way that fitness coaches, what I do can help people with their fitness, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, if I didn't, if I didn't believe in the the business coaching, then I'm basically saying, I don't believe in what I do for other people with fitness. Right. And so there's, there's, of course there's shitty coaches out there. Um, but it's like, Again, going back to the potential upside versus the potential downside, there's there's a lot of that. But yeah, I just I, I cultivated it because I, I had results. I got I I realized I took the chance, the chance paid off, and then that was further evidence for me to take greater risks over time. And um, yeah, whenever it comes to money, whenever it, yeah, whenever it comes to money, like that was the the two things that I did was save and mm -hmm. spend on on like growth, right? Like mm. that's kind of the main things. Um, and that was, that turned out to be really well. So it was kind of, it was kind of both. It was more so like, how can I, that's, that's kind of how I was thinking. I was like, how can I cover my ass? And then how could I also push myself forward? So how could I mitigate as much risk as possible? And then how could I maintain that mitigation while also taking the most risk as possible while mm -hmm. I was seeking out mentors or seeking out education, or I was just basically like, how much can I push myself without overextending myself? This is, this is exactly why I chose the registered dietitian route, because mm -hmm. if the coaching thing didn't work out, I had a fallback mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, I'll go be a registered dietitian. Worst comes to worse. I'll go be a registered dietitian at the hospital. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's fine. I was like, I'll, I'll just, I'll just do that. Um, and so, so yeah, I think that, uh, you can, you can be smart about taking the risk. This is like whenever coaches want to, uh, or any entrepreneurs, they want to take the leap. They want to quit their job and then go do the, the other thing. And I'm like, mm -hmm. fucking keep your job and do this on the side. It's like, that's, mm. that's some of the best, the, some of the best careers that you can have is like, whenever you have, like, I have a buddy who has a, like a leadership position at a corporate job mm -hmm. and he, he, it's remote and he doesn't do a lot of shit to be hundred percent honest, but he gets paid mm -hmm. really well. And then he also does the fitness coaching on the side. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, he has two incomes that are, that are doing really well. And you know, it's like, if you can find, obviously not every situation is going to be as easy as that, or as, as ideal as that, but there's lots of remote jobs or lots of different jobs that you can take. And then also do the other thing that you want to potentially make your full-time thing later on, um, you know, on the side. And it's just like, don't be stupid with the risk. Like just, you can, you can do both. You can mitigate, you can mitigate risk and also take calculated risk at the same time. I think mm -hmm. it's important. I think that's a good advice overall in a good way, like perspective to, right. to look at things when you're weighing kind of your options. So as we start to wrap up here, I'll ask you one more question. Um, when it comes to people, why did you, why were you drawn to working with people just in general? Because I'm 
fucking good at it <laughs> because, <laughs> because I've always been good at it. Like I've mm -hmm. always been, people have always like, people are my superpower genuinely mm. like emotional intelligence. I know the sound of this, ironically enough, this sounds very mm. narcissistic and um, that's okay. uh, arrogant, <laughs> but, but that's okay. I, I just, I know my strengths and I, mm -hmm. I've, I, I know that I've always been an emotionally intelligent person and I've always been charismatic and, and people have always liked me to be honest, like mm -hmm. this is just how it's been since I've been little and it comes from, but it, it, it's because of my parents. It's because mm -hmm. I have the best parents in the world. It's mm -hmm. because my, my mom is so my, so for context, my dad, my dad owns a, an auto body shop. He's been an entrepreneur mm -hmm. for 40 years. He works in Kentucky. He's been working on cars. He didn't go to college. Um, but he's worked on cars for 40 years. And so that means he's had to deal with people in Kentucky, um, in the sticks, right? Like mm -hmm. really working with some, some interesting characters. Uh, he's dealt with lots of people over time, not only customers, but then also the, the, the workers that work for him, which aren't always the most reliable and easy to deal with people. I don't know if you've ever been in an auto body shop or a garage or something, but like mm -hmm. those guys, no cars and that's mostly it right and then they 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 just they're not always the most reliable people so he's had to navigate that so i watched him deal with all those types of people and then also my mom who is like a literal saint um she is the director of physician recruiting at my at the local hospital back in kentucky mm -hmm. um and so she hires or she's over all the other people who hire the doctors who come to the hospital. So it's like, not only can she talk to anybody, she can talk to foreign doctors, right? Mm. It's like, usually that, I mean, again, this is obviously a generalization, but they, mm -hmm. they can sometimes not be the easiest types of people to work with, right? There's a lot yeah. of ego involved. There's language barriers, there's all these things, but she has been able to talk to anybody. Every interaction that I've seen with my parents, it's just like, I've, I've, I've realized they are really good at talking with people. And obviously as a kid growing up, I mimicked that a lot and I learned from them. And, uh, over time, I, I just realized that I was good with people and that that's just, I was able to become a natural coach because that's just who I was, right? Those are, those were my main strengths. And I realized I was like, oh, I just need to lean into that as much as possible. I need to lean mm -hmm. into coaching as much as possible. Um, and so, so yeah, I think over time, I just realized from an earlier age that that was my strength. And as I got older and older, I was like, oh, okay, I should probably give this coaching thing a try because it just happens so naturally for me, just talking to everyday people. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like just talking to people. I, I have to be very careful that I don't become like a fixer in a relationship that mm. I don't have my coaching come out in my relationships because it's just my natural tendencies to like offer advice or to have them view things in a certain way or ask questions or whatever it is. Right. And, um, uh, and so I've just leaned into that instead of, instead of trying to be something that I'm not or whatever, I'm just like, okay, I, I know I'm, I'm really good at this thing. So I'm just going to lean into this as much as possible and build as many skills around it as possible and, and double down on myself. And that has, paid dividends uh you know tenfold over time so yeah it was just it's i feel like it's what i was put on this earth to do is to is to help people to be yeah people. i mean i've i've just seen this firsthand experience now of just being able to talk to you it was very easy um yeah. you know well, like i <laughs> so you. how i like to just wrap things up a little bit about where we can find you and how we can work with you things like that yeah absolutely um, sure. Yeah. So check out, uh, Instagram would be cool. Go to mm -hmm. Instagram, Matt McLeod six. So M A T T M C L E O D six. Um, and then that'll, that'll cover most things. Um, but then if you don't have an Instagram or something like that, you should go to, uh, Matt McLeod.org, my website, and that mm -hmm. should have everything else, uh, that, that you can, you can check out of my stuff. Um, but yeah. Thank you, man, for, right. for having me on. Perfect. This, yeah. This no, thank really you good. very much. This was very easy for a conversation. You know, yeah, this is so. This is it. I, I, love, <laughs> I love, I love talking to people, dude. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you having me on. It was fun. It was good. Of course. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Till next time, guys.